to this evening, um, we have Dr. Dirk Frobrick from the University of Kent. He uh, studied originally um, at uh, the University of Leipzig, then went, went on to do a PhD at the University of Jena. Following that, he was at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, and uh, he's going to talk this evening about um, the citizen science project, Hunting Outbursting Young Stars. So at this point, I'll hand you over to uh, Dr. Dirk Frobrick. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, just to check, you can still hear me? I can. Yeah, okay, so everybody uh, is basically able to hear me. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the uh, introduction. Uh, what I'm uh, going to do today is, uh, uh, as uh, Tony said, uh, give you uh, an overview over our citizen science project. Uh, but the, the majority of, this, uh, of the talk will actually uh, be explaining to you uh, in, in very basic uh, terms how stars and planets form, uh, because this is the major science uh, that we are doing with that citizen science project. Uh, so we, uh, this is me, so I'm, uh, I invented this uh, project uh, five or six years ago uh, and uh, Dr. Alexander Schultz, uh, who's a, a friend of mine, we did our PhDs together uh, in, uh, in Jena and uh, he currently works at the University of St. Andrews uh, uh, and uh, he's running the big uh, observatory there. And uh, so, so he, uh, together with myself, are the, the major uh, the kind of science drivers behind uh, the uh, project. Uh, so, so the talk uh, will have kind of four uh, different parts. Uh, as I mentioned uh, already, uh, we're gonna, uh, are gonna explain briefly how stars and planets are forming so that you have an idea uh, why we are actually uh, doing this project. Uh, I, can, uh, I will then explain to you briefly why we do this uh, as a citizen science project. Uh, so uh, basically what we're doing uh, is uh, typical citizen science projects, you might have heard of some of them like Galaxy Zoo, uh, they kind of misuse um, the uh, uh, citizen scientists uh, to actually do the data analysis. Uh, our project uh, works the other way around, so we are still doing all the data analysis or most of it, uh, and the uh, citizen scientists uh, in particular uh, amateur astronomers, and they actually uh, deliver all the data or the vast majority of the data for the project. So we just analyze the data. Uh, so after that, I'm gonna show you some results. Uh, so making these, uh, making some connections to uh, what we're trying to study uh, about star and planet formation, uh, what we have already achieved. Uh, and then very briefly, uh, I show you how to participate uh, in, the, uh, in the project. Uh, and what you can get out of it uh, if you do so, uh, and then you can have any uh, questions uh, that you like to ask. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the 46th talk that I've been given about that uh, project. Uh, all the other audiences uh, you can see on the left, uh, this is the fourth time we have to do this uh, online. Uh, and uh, so hopefully Anthony doesn't forget uh, at the end to take a screenshot so you end up as like one of those uh, zoom screens here uh, uh, on my uh, on my first slide, uh, and you can see uh, pro COVID uh, before COVID, uh, I traveled quite a lot uh, to get to all the audiences. Uh, as I mentioned to Tony before, I actually prefer these talks to be face to face, but uh, uh, that sadly uh, can't happen. Uh, so, uh, okay, let's get started. Uh, how do stars and planets uh, form in, in a very uh, basic, uh, uh, basic way? And the simplest way to explain it uh, is really uh, this uh, kind of cartoon that in one form or another you might have seen uh, before. Uh, so stars uh, and planets, uh, they both form in uh, what we call giant molecular clouds. Uh, so these are clouds of gas and dust, which are in the, uh, in the mid-plane of all spiral galaxies, including our own. Uh, they're made up uh, to three quarters of uh, molecular hydrogen. That's where the name molecular cloud comes from. Uh, roughly the other quarter is helium, uh, which just makes up the mass. Uh, and then 1% in those clouds uh, is made up of 
dust. Uh, so these are very, very small dust grains. They're not, not as big as the dust you get in your house. Um, they're very tiny, they're about one micrometer uh, in size and they're made of graphite and silicates. Uh, and uh, as I said, they make up about 1% uh, of the mass. And on the, the clouds themselves, uh, they're very massive. So uh, they can go up to 10 uh, or 50 million times the mass of the sun. So there's a, a huge amount of material uh, in gas and dust in these clouds, uh, which are distributed in the, in the mid plane of, the, uh, of all the uh, spiral galaxies. Uh, and <clears throat> To make a star out of uh, these clouds, there's only one thing you really need, uh, and that is gravity. Uh, because gravity is the only force in those clouds which will try to collect material uh, uh, in, uh, in a certain place. All the other forces that you can imagine in those clouds, they will try to disperse the material. Uh, so things like rotation, uh, that uh, generates centrifugal forces uh, that will try to disperse clouds. Uh, thermal uh, pressure, uh, so uh, if you have a, a material that has a temperature, particles will move very quickly. The higher the temperature, the quicker things move. Uh, again, that will uh, try to disperse the clouds. You get magnetic fields uh, in those clouds. Again, uh, they will act in a way uh, that clouds are, uh, <clears throat> tend to disperse uh, over time if there was no gravity. Uh, and also uh, turbulent motion, uh, so things that stir up motion or, uh, of material in those clouds. All these things trying to disperse the cloud except gravity. So to make uh, basically a star anywhere in those clouds, you need gravity in that place to be the strongest of the forces. Uh, and in those clouds that happens uh, by chance uh, every now and again. Uh, so by chance, you get areas in those clouds which are denser, uh, they have a higher density of material uh, than the others. And in those dense clouds, if you, if you go above a certain threshold, gravity is winning the game. It uh, suddenly gets stronger than all the other forces uh, and <clears throat> you start what we call gravitational collapse. Uh, so suddenly, uh, if by chance enough material has been assembled uh, that the gravitational collapse can start, the material is falling uh, towards the center. So all the other dispersive forces are too small uh, and the, uh, the bit of the cloud that is above the threshold will start to collapse uh, towards the center. And <clears throat> so very quickly in the center you form what eventually will be uh, the star. You're forming this kind of core uh, in the middle, which eventually uh, uh, will, uh, will make the star. Uh, so very quickly as well, around that forming star, you form a disc-like structure, or initially it looks like a donut. Uh, uh, and this is caused by rotation. So all these regions uh, that start to collapse, they all rotate a tiny bit, uh, some of them very slowly initially, uh, but there's a physical principle uh, uh, that is called the conservation of angular momentum. Now that might not really uh, tell you a lot, uh, but uh, you might have seen that uh, on TV uh, if you've ever been really bored uh, and you watched uh, figure skating on TV. Uh, then you can see the figure skaters, uh, they stand on the ice uh, and they rotate with their arms stretched out. And uh, <clears throat> when they pull the arms in, they suddenly uh, rotate much, much faster. Uh, that is the same principle uh, of angular momentum conservation. So basically what a figure skater tells you is if you put some of your mass closer to the axis of rotation, uh, the rotation will speed up. And the same thing happens in those clouds. So there will be some rotation, uh, even if minute, but the material is moving closer to the center or the axis of the rotation of the system, uh, and your cloud will start to rotate faster and faster. Now, in the equator of that rotation, you will get a centrifugal force, the same that happens when you drive in a roundabout very, very fast. Uh, you get pushed towards the outside. Uh, that's the same centrifugal force. And eventually, that centrifugal force becomes so large that it is as big as gravity again, uh, and then material can't keep falling onto the central object in the equatorial plane of your rotation. Uh, <clears throat> it can still fall along the rotational axis because uh, there is no uh, centrifugal force. 
so uh, what you generate hence very quickly is this kind of flattened structure you first at first a donut uh, but later on a disc where material uh, is assembled uh, and, the, and the object is basically rotating uh, in the plane uh, of that uh, disc uh, what you get as well and i'm not going to really talk about this is uh, the uh, flow of material once you have the disc goes from the outer regions onto the outer edges of the disc through the disc and then from there onto the star uh, and when that happens in any system uh, at the same time material is ejected along the rotational axis uh, so you get jets uh, and outflows coming from these young forming stars and the material is moving at a couple of hundred kilometers per second perpendicular to the plane of the disc uh, this happens for all the objects uh, that accrete this way. It doesn't have to be uh, a young star with a disk. Uh, this could be a supermassive black hole and an accretion disk around that. Again, uh, uh, if you get mass accretion uh, in that system, you get these jets just for the supermassive black holes. These jets are very fast. They're half the speed of light or above. Uh, so, but it's the same uh, kind of principle. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> we're not going to really mention these outflows uh, any further uh, in the talk. Uh, what we're going to mention quite a lot is these disks uh, because uh, so what happens over time the rest of the material in that original core will basically uh, accrete onto the disk uh, be moved through the disk uh, over time and then from the inner edge uh, get somehow accreted onto the uh, onto the star uh, and at the same time in those disks this is where the planets are forming so these disks are typically the size of uh, a planetary system uh, uh, so basically uh, the size of our own solar system and the material in those disks that gas and dust uh, out of which these uh, clouds originally uh, have formed uh, <clears throat> these disks basically have to make uh, the planets uh, as long as the disks are there uh, planets can form once the disks are gone uh, the planets uh, either there will be no further planet formation uh, or at least the planet formation uh, will stop uh, so basically to make the planets you have to take these tiny uh, dust grains of one micrometer and you need to start sticking them together to make them bigger uh, make them massive enough so they can have their own gravitational uh, pull to start pulling in gases to make things like jupiter uh, uh, or uh, not pull uh, things in uh, to end up like the rocky planets uh, in our solar system uh, and uh, what we do know from observations is these disks they don't live very long astronomically speaking uh, so the entire process of forming these stars and planets it's incredibly fast uh, again on astronomical time scales uh, so the, the initial collapse to make something like uh, the sun in the middle uh, that only takes about 500,000 or half a million years. Uh, we also know these disks, they typically don't live longer than a few million years. Uh, so basically, you have to make the planets in those disks uh, uh, within a few million years from a micrometer-sized dust grain distribution with a lot of gas uh, to things like Jupiter or the Earth, uh, and you only have a few million years uh, to do this. Uh, so this is uh, in principle uh, how uh, the uh, planet and star formation uh, work. So both of these things happen at the same time. Uh, so uh, you will never really see a talk on just star formation or just planet formation anymore because uh, it's basically the same process. Uh, and uh, the process happens very quickly uh, and it nicely explains uh, things that we see in the solar system. Why are all the planets in the same plane? Uh, why is the plane exactly uh, rotating the same way uh, as the uh, star in the middle and so forth? Uh, it comes uh, basically from the angular momentum conservation during the uh, formation process. Uh, so one other thing I'm going to show you about these uh, clouds is I, I have a picture of one of them. Uh, this is actually a very small cloud that will never form uh, a star uh, at all. This has only about one solar mass and you can take a picture uh, with an optical telescope, so what you would see with the naked eye if you had a good, uh, a good telescope. Uh, and what you can see is where the cloud is, you can basically don't, you don't see any stars through the cloud. Uh, and the reason for that is the dust grains uh, in, those, uh, uh, in those clouds, they actually scatter uh, and absorb the optical light from the stars which sit behind the cloud. So if I take the cloud out, uh, the field in the middle here, 
uh, would look more or less exactly like what you can see in the corners. It would be full of stars. The, the simple reason you don't see any stars here is the light from these stars has been scattered and absorbed by the dust grains in this uh, cloud. Uh, so the actual the gas in those clouds doesn't do any of absorbing or, or scattering. It's only these uh, tiny dust grains which make only up 1% of the mass. If you take a picture of the same cloud at infrared wavelengths, and this is the right picture. So the right picture shows exactly the same part of the sky just at infrared wavelengths. Uh, and there you start seeing in the middle of the cloud here, you start seeing the stars in the background. Uh, uh, and what you see is all of those stars, they look a little bit red. Uh, and they're also fainter than the stars in the corners. Uh, and they're fainter because the, some of the light is still scattered and absorbed. So not all the light from these stars actually reaches the observer. Uh, and the reason they are red is because the blue light is scattered stronger than the red light. Uh, so basically uh, what happens is uh, like in this cartoon, you get one of the stars, you get a cloud uh, and you're trying to observe this on earth. The star emits red and blue light. Uh, let's say, and what happens is the blue light is scattered uh, much more strongly than the red light. So most of the red light will go through, and you can see that uh, on the Earth. The blue light will be scattered in all directions, uh, so not much of that actually reaches uh, the telescopes. Uh, and hence, uh, what, it, uh, what it means is the stars that you see, they're a little bit fainter, but they're definitely more red, because only the red light actually shows up uh, at your telescope. And if you had an idea of what the actual color of the uh, star was or what wavelengths uh, the star really emits and in what intensity. Uh, uh, and you can uh, observe that on the right hand side through the cloud. Then what you can learn about is what are the dust grains? What's the size of these dust grains that do the scattering? Because if these dust grains get bigger, they change the way they scatter the light. So in particular, if they start to get very large, much larger than the typical wavelengths of that light, let's say uh, all the dust grains have formed bricks, which you might say is you know, the first stage to making planets, uh, then they will be very large. There will be a couple of centimeters. They will still absorb some of the light uh, because simply if any of the photons hits one of those bricks, it will be absorbed, uh, but they will not scatter the light. So they will dim the light, uh, the blue light in the same way as the red light. Uh, so the light will still be dimmer, but it will not change the color. Uh, so, uh, but if the dust grains are very small, uh, the red light will usually go through and the blue light will not. So we can, uh, if you know the color of the star, uh, then we can work out how big are the dust grains. Now, you know that we can't look around the cloud and know what the uh, original light is uh, of the star without <clears throat> removing the cloud, so we can't do that. Uh, so that causes a problem, but you will, be, you will see later in the talk how we can actually use this effect for some of the young stars uh, that we are uh, investigating to learn something about uh, these dust grains. So, <clears throat> okay. Uh, what we are particularly interested in is how to make planets like the Earth. Uh, so I personally am not really interested in how to make Jupiter. Uh, simply because you can't live on Jupiter. We want to we will want to really investigate how uh, terrestrial planets are made, things like the Earth. Uh, and one thing uh, that we, uh, <clears throat> that most of the astronomers nowadays agree is the terrestrial or rocky planets, they're made in the inner part of the accretion disks. So roughly uh, where the Earth uh, and Mars are at the moment. So in the inner one or two, maybe three astronomical units from the star. So an astronomical unit is the distance between the sun and the earth. Uh, so basically, if you're trying to understand how these terrestrial planets like the earth are made, we need to study these disks around the young stars in great detail, very close to the star. Uh, and this is basically the challenge uh, <clears throat> that, we, uh, <clears throat> that we have. Uh, so why is this difficult? Uh, well, uh, the main reason is everything is very far away. So here are some of these accretion disks around some young stars. You can read their telephone numbers uh, up here. Uh, <clears throat> there are scale bars. Uh, most of these scale bars uh, are several hundred astronomical units. 
Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, if you can't read the numbers uh, on your screen, uh, but they give you an idea that they're typically about five to 10 times the size uh, of our own solar system. And these pictures of these disks are taken with the best eight meter ground-based telescopes with adaptive optics uh, <clears throat> that you uh, can do on the ground. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the, the light of the star in the middle has been blocked out uh, because the stars are so bright, they would outshine the accretion disks, you would see them. Uh, and uh, you can take some pictures of these disks uh, and you see their structure. Uh, so all of these disks are face on and there's things like some of them look a bit like spiral arms or arcs and things. Uh, <clears throat> but if you really want to study where the inner bit uh, of the disk, uh, you can't really do that with a normal ground-based telescope. The, the, the spatial resolution uh, is simply not good enough. So all these objects are reasonably close uh, already. Uh, so uh, studying these disks from the ground, even with eight meter telescopes or 10 meter telescopes, uh, is, is simply doesn't work. The, the resolution isn't good enough. Uh, so what can you do? Uh, well, you can spend money. Uh, that usually helps. Uh, you can spend five billion dollars to build the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, you can spend another half a billion to repair it uh, after you put in the wrong mirror. And then you can point the probably best space telescope uh, that we have at the closest nearby young stars and try to image these disks. Uh, and here's some examples of how these disks look like. Uh, actually, the disk itself you can't see. So, so this is uh, a picture of the young star HH30. Uh, the star is hiding where I've put my cursor, right in the middle. Uh, and we see the disk of that star completely edge on. So the, the dust uh, in the disk is basically blocking the light uh, and you can't see the star itself. It would be right in the middle uh, here where my cursor is. Uh, the disks, they are not flat, they're not like Saturn's rings. So if you go further away from the star, they become thicker. Uh, so we call that flare disks. So the, the height of the disk uh, goes up if you go uh, away from the star. So what happens is the, the starlight from the middle uh, is basically uh, going outwards, hitting the surface of the disk, and then is scattered backwards to the, uh, to the telescope. Uh, uh, and then you guys basically get the dark plane here, that's the mid plane of the disk, and you see the scattered light on the top and bottom uh, of, the, uh, of the disk. And the green thing is one of those jets uh, that I told you uh, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, and uh, again, you have these scale bars here, now 200 astronomical units. That's roughly the size of the solar system. So Pluto is about 40 astronomical units uh, away from the, um, from the sun. So Pluto would be about here. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, you see, you get uh, quite some detail now of these disks. Here's another one, uh, edge on. Uh, again, the star is in the middle and you see the scattered light on both sides. Uh, again, here, the star would be hiding here uh, and the disk is basically uh, going across. And, <clears throat> but even with Hubble and 5 billion US dollars, uh, the best resolution you can get is about 35 uh, astronomical units. So any detail that is smaller than that, you can't see. So you definitely can't look at the inner five astronomical units. Uh, so uh, ESO, the European uh, uh, Southern Observatory, uh, they spend a little bit less money uh, and build the uh, ALMA radio interferometry array in Chile. Uh, that's quite cheap, that's 1 billion euros. Uh, and that allows you to look at these disks uh, at radio wavelengths uh, at incredibly high resolution. Uh, and this is uh, one example uh, of one of those disks in HL Tau, one of the first ones that got observed. Again, uh, the star would sit in the middle and there you see a lot more structure suddenly. You see uh, kind of gaps. Uh, so there's rings here of material, then there's gaps. Um, there's several of these rings actually that you can see. Uh, and the spatial resolution now uh, is so good that you can uh, see details which are basically of the size of about five astronomical units. Uh, so basically, the detail you can see is the distance between the Sun and Jupiter uh, in our own solar system. Uh, not good enough to see what happens really in the inner bit uh, where the uh, terrestrial planets form. So, so Saturn is probably uh, orbiting somewhere uh, here if this was the solar system. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, looking at uh, any great detail uh, in the inner bit uh, is, uh, is still not possible, uh, but it's uh, a much, uh, much improved. Uh, picture. Uh, the only downside uh, of this is, is this is radio wavelength. So all we see is very, very cold, uh, dusty material. And in the inner bits uh, of the disks, 
uh, because they're heated by the light from the central star, uh, <clears throat> the material is quite hot. Uh, and uh, typically, there's less of the material uh, there uh, that you could actually see uh, with those uh, radio, uh, radio pictures. Uh, so <clears throat> what you actually want is a picture roughly at optical light or infrared light. Uh, uh, and you can do that uh, with the very large telescope from ESO as well. Uh, there's an instrument called Sphere, uh, and that combination, the uh, very large telescope uh, plus that instrument uh, is a bargain, 300 million euros. Uh, uh, and there you can take pictures that almost are uh, optical light, so they're, they're near infrared light, so wavelengths about four times the lengths uh, of the light you can see with the eye. Uh, and uh, you can see that these discs, uh, they look like uh, what, what I've shown you in the cartoons before and what you've seen um, before. Uh, you again, you have the light of the central stars blocked out in all the cases, and then you can see these uh, <clears throat> mid planes of the disks where you get no light, you get a scattered light uh, from the top here, uh, some light from the bottom. Uh, you have another example here that's a bit smaller, might be further away or simply just a smaller disk. Uh, you get some where you get these rings and you get these gaps uh, as well, uh, like here. Uh, and then uh, if you're lucky and you look at, uh, at this object called PDS-70, uh, again the central star would be here and when you, uh, then you see this blob, which just looks like a blob, but what that actually is, this is a forming planet in that disk orbiting uh, around that central star. So this is what you can call a protoplanet, probably something like Jupiter, uh, forming uh, around this object quite further out uh, than our Jupiter is. Uh, so there's a second planet, planet hiding in that mess up here uh, that people have found with better images uh, as well. Uh, so this is almost a picture that you would see with the, uh, uh, it, with the optical light. Uh, and again, uh, that instrument has a resolution uh, that can give you uh, five, arc, uh, five astronomical unit details for the very nearby young stars. Uh, uh, but again, it's not getting any better uh, than this. Uh, so it doesn't matter how much or how few money you spend, there's simply no way of getting a better resolution uh, for these uh, disks to learn anything about the region where the terrestrial planets form. Uh, and this is where our project comes in, because we're trying to do better uh, and definitely uh, using less money. Uh, so this is an artist's impression, how the inner bit of an accretion disk would look like. You've got the star in the middle, you have the material in the disk, uh, and there might be some material uh, sticking out, uh, either because of magnetic fields having pulled material up, uh, or there's a planet in here which disturbs the material. Uh, and what you know is, uh, I've explained that to you at the beginning, the material in that disk will orbit the central star. So let's assume the material that we can see on the bottom here is moving to the right. So uh, <clears throat> what happens if you observe this, uh, the, the total light from that system, we don't see any of that detail, all we see is the combined light. Uh, but what happens if one of those structures here, due to its orbital motion, moves in front of the star, the starlight will be dimmed uh, and it will turn red because that material here is made up of these dust grains uh, and uh, some gas and that scatters uh, the blue light away stronger than it does the red light. And over time, that structure will move and the star becomes completely visible again. Uh, and then you might get, uh, if you have a structure like this, a second dimming event uh, <clears throat> where the, the structure dims, uh, the light of the system dims again uh, and then becomes brighter. Uh, and if this structure here survives a whole orbit, it will come back. Uh, and then uh, what you can do is you can actually use this technique by simply just monitoring the brightness of this whole system over time and looking for how long is the star actually dim. Uh, that will tell you the spatial extent of the occulting structure in the direction it is moving. And the detail uh, that you can resolve is as small as the star itself, because as soon as that structure moves by more than the diameter of the star, uh, you have new uh, material in front of it, uh, which will behave different and change the light differently. So the, the resolution you can achieve with this uh, is basically as small as the star, which is about 1% of an astronomical unit. Uh, so this technique, at least in that one dimension uh, where the material is moving, this is 500 times better than what you can do with any direct imaging or interferometry, uh, whatever you do. Uh, so, uh, and that's uh, basically what we're trying to do. Now, uh, some people 
don't really uh, can put that in context how much better this is. So I have this uh, nice example uh, that I usually use to explain how good that resolution really is. Now, uh, <clears throat> you know the size of the moon on the sky is about half a degree. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> your naked eye can resolve things which are one arc minute uh, apart on the sky. So one arc minute is a 60th uh, of a degree. Uh, if that doesn't tell you much, uh, that's basically the same as uh, you can see a car that is five kilometers away uh, and you can see up to that distance if it has two lights or just the one. Uh, so if, if the car is up to five kilometers away uh, and you have a direct line of sight, your eye can tell if there's two lights or just the one. Uh, so <clears throat> that's the resolution that your naked eye has. It's actually pretty good. Uh, the best ground-based telescopes, uh, the one uh, where I showed you the pictures uh, before, they have a resolution of about uh, half an arc second. So one arc second being a 60s uh, of an arc minute. Uh, and uh, so this is basically uh, 60 times two better than your naked eye. Uh, uh, which means you can see if there's two lights uh, on the car or not, uh, up to about 600 kilometers away. So uh, most of you are somewhere in Bath, uh, which means uh, you can see basically uh, if a car in Edinburgh has two lights on or not with the best ground-based telescopes. So the radio interferometry technique uh, with ALMA or the, uh, <coughs> uh, the BLT uh, in the uh, near infrared, uh, that has a resolution of 0 0.025 arc seconds. Uh, so converted to the car example, uh, this uh, is about 12,000 kilometers. So the other side uh, of the globe, provided there's a direct line of sight. Uh, now, for the nearest young stars, that corresponds to this distance between the Sun and Jupiter, these five astronomical units. Uh, but both of these techniques here uh, they are dependent uh, of, the di of the distance. So they are only as good uh, if the objects are very close, uh, but most of the young stars are much further away. Our technique, by just looking at the brightness, doesn't matter how far away uh, that system is because it's about timing the duration of these dimming events, uh, which you can do as long as you can see the, uh, the light from the star. Uh, which means most of the stars that we are investigating uh, they're about 3,000 light years away compared to the nearby young stars, which are uh, maybe uh, something like uh, 300 light years away. Uh, so our stars are also 10 times further. Uh, and our resolution uh, is 1% uh, of the astronomical unit. So in our car example, uh, what it means is because our uh, investigation is independent of the distance, uh, we can basically park our car on Mars uh, and still see if there's two lights on or not. That's the resolution uh, that our technique has uh, uh, in terms of the two lights um, uh, on a car. So uh, that actually uh, kind of tells you how much better our technique is. Uh, so it doesn't matter, the, the most modern direct techniques can get to 12,000 kilometers, which is the other side of the Earth. Uh, this technique of measuring the durations of occultations uh, that can uh, go basically all the way to Mars. That's how much better that technique is. Okay, now, uh, but we can do even better than that. We can actually look at the surface of these young stars. Uh, so I told you that the material from the uh, inner part of the disk will fall onto the surface of the star. Uh, so the star gains mass uh, this way uh, <clears throat> over time. Uh, and when the material kind of hits the surface, uh, it crashes at very high speeds onto the surface. And it does that in these kind of funnels, so all the material ends up in, uh, in a small number of places. Uh, and it basically lights up uh, the surface part where it hits. Uh, and these are basically uh, what we call hot spots uh, on the surface. Uh, the stars can also have these dark spots, similar to sunspots uh, that the sun has. Uh, and the whole system is rotating. So every now and again, you will see, let's say, the bright spots at the front, uh, which will make the whole star brighter. Uh, and then after half an orbital period, these spots are going to be on the back and we can't see them. Uh, and uh, the star will basically be dimmer. Uh, so you get, basically, you see a light modulation, the star getting brighter and fainter with its own rotation period. Uh, and again, uh, we can A, use this uh, to measure the rotation period of the star. We can see how fast it rotates. 
but also we can uh, observe how uh, the uh, how much the light actually changes uh, from faint uh, to dim at different wavelengths and we can use that uh, to even determine the temperature of these spots and how big they are as a fraction uh, of the size of the surface. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that is something uh, that we uh, they basically allows us to kind of map the surface of these stars uh, over time. You can even see these things move, uh, uh, at least in the direction uh, of rotation, uh, because uh, basically if they move faster uh, than the rotation uh, over time, uh, you will get a, a change uh, in, the, uh, in the signal that you can observe uh, uh, in the light. So uh, to summarize, uh, what we want to do is in our research, we want to basically map the structure uh, of these accretion disks to very fine detail, uh, because then we can put that detail in numerical simulations and actually see what kind of planets uh, do you form uh, if you put the correct uh, structure in the accretion disks. Uh, and we want to see how the accretion really works in detail. Uh, so how do these spots form? How long do they live? What temperatures do they have? Uh, uh, how do they change in size uh, and so forth. Uh, so these are the two main things uh, in terms of scientific research that we're trying to do. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we want to do this uh, basically with small telescopes, small telescopes that some of the amateurs have. Uh, this is our small telescope at the University of Kent. Uh, yes, it's a 40 centimeter mirror, so it's one of the larger ones. Uh, but uh, uh, basically this kind of research uh, it's impossible to do with large telescopes because it's impossible uh, to uh, monitor uh, young stars uh, uh, in the way that we need to because what we want to do in our hunting outbursting young stars project uh, is we want to monitor the brightness of the young stars over 25 years. Uh, and we want to do this uh, once or twice a day. Uh, at several wavelengths, so across the optical spectrum from the ultraviolet uh, to the infrared. Uh, <clears throat> so we want one picture uh, for every young star that we, uh, that we can think of uh, over 25 years uh, to do this kind of analysis. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, that's quite a lot uh, of data that we need. Uh, so one of the things we did is we actually look at clusters of young stars. Uh, so in every picture that people take, uh, there's uh, tens, hundreds, uh, if not a thousand young stars in every picture. So each shot uh, gives you a brightness measurement uh, of uh, several hundred uh, young stars. It gives you uh, quite good uh, statistics. Uh, so we have basically 25 clusters of stars uh, or star forming regions that we uh, observe and we only use these small and intermediate sized telescopes because this is what the uh, amateurs have. Now the targets that we picked, uh, they're all beautiful. Uh, that's the main reason uh, we picked those targets. So all these things, many of them you might know, the Orion Nebula, uh, the Rosette Nebula here, the Elephant Trunk Nebula, the C Cocoon Nebula down here, we've got a Christmas tree cluster, the Cone Nebula. Uh, all these are very, very nice looking things and all the amateurs, they take beautiful pictures like these ones of these uh, regions anyway. Uh, so we are not interested in the beautiful pictures. That is something the amateurs are much better uh, at doing than we are. Uh, we are interested in the brightness measurements. So basically all we want is we want all your beautiful pictures. Uh, and what we do is we measure the brightness uh, of all the stars uh, in them. Uh, so the reason this works uh, with amateurs, uh, even in the UK, is uh, well, you can take any radar picture of the UK at a given uh, moment in time. This, this is from a couple of years ago. Uh, and you put a marker down where your own telescope is, and uh, it's pretty clear when you try to observe it's going to be cloudy. Uh, but there's always some places in the UK, or there's a very high chance that some places of the UK are actually clear. You've got two choices. You can move your telescope around every night. That's not really working. Uh, or you use all the telescopes which are already there. And on the right, each marker is an amateur, uh, amateur astronomy society in the UK. And you can see they basically cover most of the uh, UK. Each society has several members with their own telescopes uh, who basically, there will be each night uh, at least a, a few telescopes uh, which are in a part of the UK that is clear. Uh, and uh, so that's basically how that idea was born of doing this uh, with amateur telescopes. 
so <clears throat> where are we at the moment? So we started this project some time ago. We have now 70 uh, people from 11 different countries across uh, Europe and the world uh, to say, so all the maps here, the, all the blue uh, little telescopes show amateur telescopes that have delivered data to us. So there's a large number in the UK. Uh, in Europe, we've got a huge number of people in Spain, uh, across the rest of Europe, we've got some people, uh, we've got a few in the United States, uh, and uh, we've got one lucky guy who has a remote telescope uh, in Chile. Uh, we have now 30,000 images, uh, and we've made almost 140 million brightness measurements uh, of stars in them that we can analyze. And uh, <clears throat> so this graph just tells you over time how many pictures we had uh, so this is uh, yesterday, uh, we had about 29,700 picture images uh, <clears throat> that we have uh, obtained via the amateurs uh, up to this, um, this moment in time. So <clears throat> this is one example of how it looks. Uh, that is in the Christmas tree cluster. These are three pictures taken by one amateur from Ashford uh, and they've taken uh, roughly two weeks apart each. Uh, so they cover a whole month uh, and they're just blinking here. Uh, and uh, what you can see is there's several stars which change the brightness. So I've circled the ones that you can see with the naked eye. So every star in one of those circles changes their brightness. This, the really bad one that disappears in one of the pictures completely. Uh, but every other star in the circle here really uh, also changes the brightness. And these are the stars we're really interested in. Uh, and if you actually let the computer do the analysis, all the young stars, or almost all the young stars in that picture uh, actually do change their brightness uh, <clears throat> at a level smaller than what your naked eye can do. So if you let the computer do the analysis, uh, and that's what we do, we investigate all the stars in those pictures, uh, <clears throat> then uh, this works uh, quite, uh, <clears throat> uh, quite well. So how, how do we do this? Uh, well, the people just basically uh, send us the pictures. They tell us for what target region uh, <clears throat> they have taken the picture. Uh, and uh, then uh, we do uh, a what is called uh, astrometry. So we find the coordinates of all the stars uh, in the picture. That is the first step. We have a second step that then measures the brightness of all the stars uh, in that picture and calibrates that uh, properly. Uh, and uh, then we do some uh, what we call post-processing uh, wizardry. Uh, I have a couple of slides, uh, but I'm not gonna uh, I'm gonna skip over them uh, in a minute. Uh, uh, in uh, just to uh, make up some time. Uh, so, uh, but uh, what we can do with this is uh, we can basically then automatically or manually analyze the light curve of any of these stars and see uh, what you can learn. So this is one of the examples. That's the Pelican uh, star forming region. That's near the uh, North American nebula in Cygnus. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> there's a star in there called V1496, which we've analyzed, it's the one in the circle, uh, if you were interested in where it is uh, on the sky. So uh, the first thing we can do is we can have a look at the brightness of that star over time. So the, the x-axis here is time. Uh, every uh, 100 days, there's one of those markers here. Uh, and this is the brightness. So bright is always on the top, uh, faint on the bottom. These are the magnitudes on the y-axis. And the different colors basically tell you uh, which wavelengths the light is in. So green is the visual light, red is the red light, and black is the infrared light. And what you can see, this star here moves up and down uh, all the time by about uh, two magnitudes, which is about a factor of five. So it changes its brightness by a factor of five, uh, and it looks more or less random. Uh, but it's actually, uh, the star goes up and then down again, uh, up and down again. Uh, and we'll see in a minute uh, if it does that regularly or not. And uh, what I've done here for this, this is about two years worth of uh, measurements. Uh, and all the points I plotted here are taken with our own telescope uh, in Kent. And you can see uh, the weather in Kent is actually not too bad. You can get a lot of uh, observations. Uh, uh, but this is two uh, years worth of data. That's basically all you can do uh, for, uh, for that star. Uh, and then what we asked is all the participants for six weeks, uh, more or less exactly two years ago, 2018 in August and September, we asked all our uh, participants to observe that target every night uh, it was clear. Uh, and these are the detailed light curves for just those six weeks. And again, the same filters, infrared, red, green, blue, uh, and uh, two other ones. And uh, what you now see is how much more data points we have in those six weeks alone compared to 
the uh, two years with just one telescope. So that's the beauty of this project. We basically have a data point in every filter in every night. So each of these little groups of data points here is one night. Uh, uh, so the gaps are basically because there's no one uh, observing for us in Asia. Uh, so we have people in the US, which are the points on the right of these groups, uh, and in Europe, which are the people on the left of these groups. Uh, and what you can see is this star, it has these, makes these dimming events, it goes up and down uh, over time uh, in all the uh, normal optical filters in exactly the same way. And uh, uh, we had a student basically trying to find out what is going on uh, in, uh, in that star. So what really explains uh, these dimming events? And uh, the first thing uh, he did is he, he had a look, is this, are these dimming events actually periodic? Do they happen over and over again uh, regularly? Uh, and indeed they do. You can do, uh, you can calculate something that we call a periodogram in the top left. Uh, and what you see, there's a peak here at a time of about 31 day, which means there's periodicity in those dimming events uh, roughly uh, once a month. Uh, and what you then can do is you can plot the brightness of the star as a function of uh, that uh, the face or the uh, periodicity. So you basically don't plot the light curve against time, you plot it against the fraction of the period that it is in. Uh, so you start at some random time, you go for 31 and a half days, and then you start basically plotting again from the left. Uh, and that is what you, what you call that folded light curve. Uh, and if all the dimming events would look exactly the same, all the points would nicely line up and you would see something like uh, a nice trough here and going up again. Uh, but that's not the case. What you see is at the beginning uh, and the end of the period, the star is bright. Uh, but in between, at about half the period, it can be a little bit dimmer than uh, during the bright stage uh, or quite a lot dimmer. Uh, but every time it has one of those dimming events, uh, the, there is a different uh, amount of dimming going on. So it's not something that's always the same. There's something that comes back every month, uh, but it's changing. Uh, so now what could uh, that be? Uh, so we think this is material in the disk that is orbiting uh, at a, at, with a period of about uh, one month around uh, that star. Uh, so one thing we can also do is we can have a look, how does the brightness of the star change? That is the uh, y-axis here, uh, compared to how does the color change? Uh, and this is uh, what brings us back to the scattering that we talked about at the, uh, at the beginning. So the star typically, if there's no dimming, uh, it's, it sits here uh, at the top, and then when it gets fainter, uh, it also becomes redder, uh, uh, which is exactly what you would, uh, would expect if there's dust uh, grains scattering the light. Uh, but it's actually slightly different. So there's, there's these two dashed lines here, the blue and the orangey line. Uh, and this is how the star should behave if uh, the material in the disk would be made up of the material that we know of uh, makes up these interstellar uh, clouds uh, the stars are forming from. Uh, and they clearly see it doesn't do that. Uh, so the, 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 star, uh, the starlight is not as red as you would expect uh, when it is going dimmer. Uh, and what it tells us is the dust grains in the material, they're already larger than the one micrometer dust grains uh, these uh, clouds start with. Uh, so uh, they have increased uh, in size. Uh, they're not bricks yet because bricks wouldn't change the color at all. So the starlight would just go up and down, uh, but um, they're definitely larger than one micrometer. So this is uh, quite nice. So this material in that disk that starts to grow, it's the onset uh, of what you can call planet formation uh, is clearly visible uh, in, that, uh, in that disk. Uh, what you can also do is you can estimate for each orbit how much material really is there going in front of the star for each of these uh, periods. So each of the period here just has a number uh, and the bar basically tells you how much mass is there uh, in front uh, of the star. Uh, it's a kind of a random axis here, but you can put a real number on it. So if uh, one in that plot means it's about 0.03% of the mass of the moon. So it's a sizable fraction, but not really, uh, really a lot of material. Uh, and you can see sometimes there's almost nothing there. And then one period later, there's suddenly there's a huge amount of material uh, and then uh, it gets smaller again. So the amount of mass uh, <clears throat> that is in these structures 
uh, that can vary basically within 30 days, the material is moving in and out of that structure, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. Uh, so you, uh, <clears throat> the material isn't really stable uh, in these structures for a long time. Uh, so uh, what is going on? So we have basically uh, something in the way of the star every now and again. So, so what we think is happening, the inner part of that accretion disk uh, somehow warped upwards. Uh, so you can do this two ways. Uh, you can have the star not having the same rotation axis of the disk uh, as indicated here, and then magnetic fields from the star can drag the disk material up on one side and down on the other. Uh, and then uh, if the, so it would look like this uh, uh, on both sides, but the disk is orbiting. Uh, and after half uh, an orbit, so for uh, at one stage, that material here is in the way and the star will look dim because we're looking through that uh, warp. Uh, half an orbit later, uh, this part would be uh, on this side, uh, or in other words, we would look from this part, uh, from this side here, uh, and then we would look straight onto the star and the star would appear uh, bright. Uh, so, but we know the orbital period uh, of about 30 days, uh, which means that structure here uh, is about 0 0.05 astronomical units from the star. And this is too far to be dragged up by the magnetic fields. That won't work. Uh, so uh, there's simply no way magnetic fields can do this, uh, but we still see that structure. Uh, so the only other way is you do this uh, with another object, uh, probably a, a, a young planet uh, in that disk that is uh, already there, has already formed, and that is uh, inclined in its orbit compared to the outer uh, main disk uh, around that star. So something like in that picture here from the Hubble website. And we are looking kind of this way. Uh, and the, uh, if you have a planet like that, what I do is, is it tilts the inner bit uh, of the accretion disk, everything inside, it will tilt. Uh, uh, and uh, that is basically the structure that is then orbiting uh, around. So after half an orbit, we would then look again, basically from the left, see the system bright uh, uh, and uh, half an orbit later we would again be on this side and the star would be uh, faint uh, and the material in that uh, disk here uh, is moving about uh, at reasonably large uh, rates over time. Uh, so what we can basically infer is from that light curve is there has to be some planet in that system uh, reasonably uh, close in that is already there so we don't have any direct evidence uh, but we have a lot of indirect evidence uh, in that light curve uh, from that star about uh, an, an, a young planet that is forming in that system. Uh, let's have a, a look at one uh, further example uh, towards the end uh, of another star in the Pelican Nebula. It has this telephone number uh, and uh, it sits here uh, at the bottom. Uh, again, uh, what you can do, let's switch over that, you can have a look at the long-term behavior of the light. Again, the different colors uh, show you uh, the brightnesses, uh, so in red. And what you see is over about 10 years, this star kind of goes up and down a little bit uh, <clears throat> by about 10 or 20%. Uh, but there's a lot of scatter uh, in the data. You think, oh, this might just be uh, errors in the measurements, uh, people not measuring the brightness uh, accurately. Uh, but actually uh, it's not, these variations here are real. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> again, uh, what we have done is we have analyzed, is this uh, periodic? Uh, and indeed, this star uh, has a period. Again, here's the folded light curve. Uh, and the period of that star is basically 20 hours. Uh, so it's an extremely fast uh, uh, varying object. Uh, <clears throat> so what we think is these, there are spots on the surface of that star. Uh, and the star has a rotation period of about 20 uh, hours. Uh, and the, the accuracy, because we have data for four years, uh, the accuracy of that period uh, uh, we can measure it with uh, is about 35 seconds. Uh, so we can measure the period uh, as accurate uh, as half a minute uh, with the data um, that we have taken. And uh, what you can do with this is because we have so much data here, uh, you can see the folded light curve here, it still looks a bit noisy and you can think again, oh, this might just be uh, measurement errors. Uh, but the reason uh, that nice uh, kind of sign fit here uh, doesn't seem to work is that the amplitude of the variation uh, actually changes over time. So sometimes there's a large vari variation, sometimes there's a small one. So what we have done is over those four years is we've basically measured the amplitude uh, of the variation uh, in magnitudes as a function of time. 
So what you can see is uh, at the beginning of our data, the amplitudes uh, in the different filters were reasonably large and then they've dropped to small values. Uh, and then they've increased again uh, after about a year and a half uh, to about 10%. So it's quite large variations. Again, that has then dropped over about a year uh, and then it's slowly uh, increasing again. Uh, uh, and uh, at the moment, uh, the current date uh, would be somewhere there. And uh, as I explained it uh, at the beginning, what you can do with this is, uh, if you know these are spots on the surface, we can try to calculate from the amplitudes at the different wavelengths how hot these spots are and how large they are. And this is uh, what we have done here. So the, the red po points basically tell you what is the temperature uh, of these spots uh, in, uh, in degrees Kelvin. Uh, and the blue points here tell you over time what is the size uh, of the spots. Uh, and this is expressed in fraction of the visible surface uh, of the star. Uh, so you can basically see here uh, that the spots start off uh, at a slightly higher temperature, 5,600 Kelvin, uh, and they drop off uh, towards about 5,300 Kelvin, uh, and they start off occupying about 30% uh, of the visible surface of the star, so it's 15% of the stellar surface, so quite large, uh, and then they drop off to about 10 or 15%. And you can see basically the variations here. Uh, so you can see the spots, uh, they, they slowly get larger, uh, 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 and then they, again, they, they, they shrink again. Uh, the temperature changes as well. So some, sometimes these spots are hotter um, than in, uh, at other times. Uh, and basically, <coughs> uh, this is uh, just a study that uh, this actually works. Uh, uh, what we're now going to do is we're going to do exactly the same with a PhD student for all the young stars that we have to really study how often do these spots occur, how quickly do they typically change their temperature and their sizes uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, so uh, really statistically look uh, at uh, what happens on a large number of these uh, uh, stars and we have now the data to do this and no other survey uh, has the same uh, ability uh, to really do that. Uh, how can you participate uh, just in five minutes? We have a nice website, the address is on the last slide, uh, where there's a lot of inst uh, instructions and a target list. So uh, we invite you to read that. Uh, and then simply you observe uh, any, any filter you have, any exposure time you want, any field of view. Uh, you take some calibration frames like darks uh, and flat fielding, maybe stack images uh, to get uh, to uh, fainter stars. Uh, but that's really all uh, that you uh, need to do. And uh, it's, it's a very simple project because even if you have just five minutes, you can take a picture that is actually useful, uh, useful to us. You don't have to spend hours and hours uh, uh, of time, uh, even a single picture with a small telescope when it was a cloud, uh, a hole in the clouds uh, for 10 minutes uh, is useful because you might be the only person looking at that target at that night because everybody uh, else had uh, cloudy skies or wanted to sleep. Uh, and then all you need to do is uh, you uh, get an account uh, on our server uh, and you simply uh, upload the pictures. There's again, there's a bit of uh, uh, clicking to tell us uh, what the data is for. We call that processing. Uh, there's lots of help videos on YouTube that explains uh, the process. Uh, and, uh, uh, but within kind of 20 minutes, you learn how to, uh, how to do this. Uh, and then uh, you can actually extract the data. So the data is public as soon as the processing is done. It's in a public database where everybody, even without a login, uh, can basically uh, take out their light curves uh, uh, and uh, you can investigate them yourself. You can see where your data points are uh, and uh, you can do your own research projects. Uh, so we currently uh, in, uh, in the process of uh, kind of uh, making some nice help videos to, to, to really explain to you a bit more in detail uh, what you can do with the data. Uh, so that will get more interesting uh, in the uh, midterm future. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, you can get your name on a paper. So we uh, actually uh, publish uh, these results. Uh, so uh, the uh, paper that I've showed you, uh, the first result at V1496, this is this paper. And virtually everybody uh, starting after Brinkridge-Decklum here is an amateur astronomer. 
uh, who is delivered data. Uh, the result uh, from the last uh, object that I've shown you, uh, that is the paper we've just published uh, at the beginning uh, of this month. Uh, and we have a, sec a next paper already in preparation, uh, where again, we're gonna put all the amateurs on. Uh, so it's gonna look like this. Uh, that hopefully comes out uh, next year when my PhD student uh, has actually finished uh, the work. So uh, that's it really uh, from me. Uh, there's some contact details. Uh, so our website is at hoist.space, so it's easy to remember. Uh, uh, and all the other details uh, are there. We, we have a Facebook page, a Twitter account, and a YouTube channel uh, if you're interested in. Uh, so that's it from me. Thank you. That's brilliant. I loved it. Yes. Oh, at least one. Thank you. <laughs> Very brilliant. And yes. Uh, it's a project like no other. I'd like to mention we have a distinguished attendee this evening from Japan, Dr. Sadaharu Uehara, who is the secretary of the Herschel Society from Japan. And he's on tonight. And if he clicks video, we could see him. And perhaps we might invite him to say a few words. That was a very, very good talk. And thank you, Dr. Frobridge. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so sorry, <laughs> my room is very dark. <laughs> thank you very much. There, for is, there is Dr. Uehara. Good evening or good morning. Okay, yeah, good, 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 good morning. Yeah. Now the. Uh, 4 30. Do you have <laughs> uh, a comment, sir? Uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, interesting and uh, charming story for the uh, uh, possibility to observe the uh, staging of the uh, birth of the young, uh, young, young stars, no, 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 young planets. And thank you for your uh, <clears throat> introducing this chance to uh, watch this nice lecture uh, uh, far from Japan. Thank you very much. Very and good. we appreciate uh, your uh, the uh, the, uh, host, uh, the kind uh, <clears throat> service uh, the uh, treatment for us you know, the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, British Royal Institute and the uh, Herschel Society. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Right. If um, there are any questions, we'll see what's in the chat channel and. Um, if you raise your hand, which you can do either in Zoom or just by raising your hand in, uh, physically, if you've got your camera on, uh, then we'll, we'll deal with the questions. So, so we have from Roger, um, is that Roger Moses? Uh, are there any other processes going on? That, Given, uh, given the amplitude changes that you see. So yeah, is there anything that can compete with structures coming out of the disk, out plane, and into the line of sight? Yeah, so, so the, uh, the, um, uh, what I explained uh, is basically a very simplistic view uh, of how these light curves uh, of those stars uh, are made up. Uh, so uh, the, there's a lot of reasons for the variability. So one can be the spots on the surface uh, from either accretion spots or the dark spots. Uh, uh, that's usually modulated uh, with the rotation of the star. Uh, then you have uh, <clears throat> uh, the general brightness of the star, which in part is really dominated by how much material is really falling onto the star. So the accretion rate uh, how much mass per unit time is falling on a star that uh, and that is highly variable over time uh, uh, and then there's uh, structures in the disk which can uh, occult uh, the material uh, so the the objects that we've picked at the beginning uh, basically they're simple in the way that most of the variation uh, is actually caused by only one of those reasons and all the other processes don't happen. Now, the general light curve of a random young star uh, is a combination of all these things. 
uh, and it's very, very difficult to disentangle that. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, if you have uh, a star that varies its accretion rate uh, by a factor of two every couple of, of days or, or, or even uh, hours, uh, if that has uh, at the same time a spot uh, that is rotating every month, uh, then it's very hard or basically impossible to find that rotational signature from the star because uh, the light just goes up or down by a factor of two uh, all the time. Uh, <clears throat> if you got the, the disk really edge on and it's very, very structured, uh, again, the light curve will look basically random. Uh, but uh, what you can do is you can actually look at how the colors change uh, at the same time. So it might look random, but the color changes uh, compared to how uh, the brightness changes, they at least give you an idea. Is this an object where it's probably disk material occulting, a randomly structured one, or the accretion rate changing in a random way? Uh, so, uh, so the first task that all the students will have is basically group all the light curves into uh, simple to analyze things uh, because uh, the general light curve of any young star is a nightmare in particular over, over long periods. Uh, remember one thing, these spots they appear and they disappear. Right? The accretion columns will switch on and off. So sometimes you see the signal, uh, sometimes you don't. These spots move on the surface like the sunspots move on the, uh, the, the, the surface as well. So. Uh, <clears throat> And it's actually that motion I'm really interested in. Uh, so uh, we've tried this for one or two objects and you can really see uh, the spots moving uh, over time uh, on the surface of the stars. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> that is something uh, that, that is quite interesting. Uh, so, so generally, uh, yes, there's a lot of reasons uh, and uh, we, we, we basically need to find out or we need to find the easy to analyze objects first. Uh, and the ones where all three mechanisms work at the same time, you just don't analyze because it's too complicated. Thanks very much. Right, um, the person who's on as 116667, <laughs> ask them to unmute <laughs> and they can ask a question. <laughs> that was me. Uh, my question was that the observations that you've been making or your um, participants have been making uh, of the stars that show some variations in the brightness um, have led you to the conclusion that those are the ones that are in the process of creating planets. But um, I mean, I question that assumption because in a nebula, there are so many clusters of tiny spots of light um, I'm just what I'm just questioning the whole assumption process actually is that is that fair of me to do so oh yes definitely a fair question uh, so uh, well we, 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 we have chosen clusters of stars uh, uh, originally because when we started uh, these were the only uh, stars where you have had a really good estimate of how far away they are because they're in a cluster they're all in the same distance uh, which allows you to actually measure the distance uh, to these clusters, uh, which also gives you basically for every star in your picture, a kind of a probability that they're part of the cluster or not. Uh, <clears throat> since uh, a couple of years, we have the Gaia satellite who has actually made distance measurements for every single star uh, that is visible. Uh, so uh, what we can do is we can really pick out stars at a particular distance where all the other stars are. Uh, and we know these clusters are all uh, young, uh, so you can determine the age uh, based on their brightness and color. Uh, so uh, the stars that we analyze, uh, we know they're young uh, and we know they're part of the cluster. So, so, so that is a 100% solid assumption. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned, that, that last example that I showed you, that's actually not part of the Pelican Nebula. That object is in the foreground, it's only halfway there. Before Gaia, we didn't know that. So now we know within uh, probably uh, 10 light years how far away that star is. Uh, so astronomy up to five years ago was really, really painful. Uh, now it's brilliant. Uh, so uh, we know for all these stars that are actually young. So that is an assumption that, that is 100% correct. 
So what, what do you think is happening in the other stars that are not producing planets? What is, what's going on there? Uh, the, the, the other stars, uh, <clears throat> they vary, some, some stars vary as well. So stars like the sun, when they are fusing hydrogen, they don't vary. They all probably have planets as well, they just can't detect them. Uh, uh, but you can get uh, variations because they're eclipsing binaries, uh, you get giant stars which vary. Uh, <clears throat> so the data set we have is actually brilliant. You can find all sorts of things, uh, <clears throat> all variable stars in the picture we can analyze. So now we actually know where they are with Gaia. We have a distance, we know if they're giant stars, we know if they are stars like the sun uh, and so forth. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, basically, Every star that varies has probably a different reason for variability. Mm. So, so the, the light curves, they can tell you, for example, is it a, an eclipsing binary? Is it two stars orbiting each other and we see one star moving in front of the other one uh, and so forth. So they, they are easy to pick out. Uh, uh, but the young stars that vary, uh, if it's not one of those clear cut things like, oh, there's just spots as a sinusoidal variation, uh, then uh, it takes a lot of effort uh, from the students to go one by one through the light curve uh, and actually find out really what's going on in each individual example. And for many of them, you might actually say it's probably uh, disks, disk material, uh, but the details are unclear. So that's why we're actually looking at thousands of stars at the same time. That's the point of looking at uh, all these stars at the same time is to find statistically, how is the disk material distributed? So uh, we look at uh, a thousand stars over 25 years, that gives you 25,000 years of a light curve of an average star, so to speak. Uh, and that allows you to basically look, what is the typical structure? How many small blobs are in the disk? How many large blobs are in the disk? Uh, where are they? Are they close into the star? Are they uh, very far out? Uh, and uh, that's what we want to find out because the pictures of these disks don't tell us that. Everything over five astronomical units is smeared out. We don't know the small scale structure and that's what we're trying to find out by looking at many, many stars because they're all individually completely different. Uh, but on average, we're building up a statistically correct picture how these disks really look like because no one really knows that. Uh, everybody has computer models uh, where they put in some kind of structure of the disk or let the computer work one out. But if you can't say this is the correct structure, then those models are of no real value. They might form planets that we see, but if they use completely wrong assumptions, uh, then they're worthless. And that's what we're basically trying to do, kind of help to verify some of those models. Have you had any confirmation over the period of observation uh, of your uh, of your of the correctness of your assumptions. Uh, what do you mean? In any planets, I mean, in the period that you, we're talking about, 25 years, I think you said? Uh, well, we've only done five. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, the, the, the 25 years, hopefully we, we can do this for another 20. Uh, <clears throat> so that planet that I uh, mentioned, uh, there's, there's no way uh, at the moment uh, to actually prove that we are right. Uh, but uh, of all the possibilities to get a light curve like that, that is the only one that actually makes sense, that explains all the data we have. So uh, it's basically by exclusion. There's a lot of ways to get a light curve like that, uh, but, all, uh, but all the other ways uh, have some problem that can't explain certain features. And that's the last of the opportunities. You might say, oh, I have another uh, theory that, uh, and that is fine. If, if you come up with a different explanation that explains all the data, that's uh, as valid an explanation uh, as ours. We just couldn't uh, come up with any other explanation. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to ask a question. Oh, let's um, go to Tony Vale then. Oh, uh, before you ask a question, Tony, thank you very much. Uh, he's one of the people who sends me data. <laughs> oh, right. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I was just, uh, um, I don't know whether you can hear me, Dirk. Yes. Yeah, I was just a bit um, curious. I, 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 I kind of missed that the accretion disk is flared. You, you mentioned the flared accretion disk. Could you just explain uh, why it's flared as you go further away from the star? 
Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the real reason, uh, <clears throat> I'm not 100% sure. It has something uh, to do with uh, kind of all, all, all the forces that are going on uh, in, the, uh, in the disk. So, so basically the, the inner part of the disk is hotter because it's heated by the starlight uh, from the center. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, <clears throat> so the, uh, <clears throat> uh, basically uh, it's, you don't need to have it uh, completely flared. So actually I don't really 100% know why it is flared. Observationally, we see that, uh, right? So in all the pictures, uh, the height of the disc goes up. Yeah. Uh, there's less and less, so the, the density radially goes, uh, goes down. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> so, but uh, uh, to be honest, I, I actually don't know. I need to actually try to read this up, why the discs uh, are flared in that way. Uh, <clears throat> it probably has something to do with the angular momentum conservation uh, and, and other things. Uh, is it likely, is it likely to be just these types of stars, these young stars, or would it be a typical thing of any accretion disk, say, around a dwarf nova as well? Uh, probably uh, not so much. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, I think it has something to do with the ratio of the masses uh, of the disk and the central object. Uh, it will have something to do with the amount of mass that is in those disks. Uh, right. uh, so, and where the mask is, uh, and uh, we know some stars, they don't really have a disc around them. They have something more like a torus. Right. Um, and uh, <clears throat> this is just individual stars. Uh, so once you get to binaries, things get really complicated. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so um, there, there's no real reason to, to having them exactly as flat as Saturn's rings. Um, so Saturn's rings are probably, uh, there are uh, gravitational forces at bay that will keep them flat. Uh, you got the moons basically who keep them uh, in, uh, in the plane uh, and uh, as thin as they are. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the flared nature of the accretion disks, um, I would have to read that up or ask someone. I suppose as they get further, I mean, the, the, the flaring was taking place quite a distance from the star in terms of what we would think of as the solar system. It's, it's probably way beyond what we would call the solar system. So it's kind of quite remote from the star where it's really flaring away. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I mean, you can see it, it's going all the way, it's getting thicker. Yeah. And, and some of the, the later disks, uh, uh, so, so the examples I showed you with the Hubble Space Telescope, these are very young stars. There's still a lot of material around in that envelope that comes moving in. And that's probably one of the reasons the disks are thicker and further out. If you get to these older systems where it's basically, it already has started to form the planets, there's not no material further out. Uh, they tend to be, if you look at the um, ALMA images, they look thinner, even further out. So there's less flaring going on. So it might just be, uh, it's that infolding material from the, uh, from the outer envelope uh, where the material moves in. Okay. Uh, that's, that keeps yeah. them thicker on the outside when they're younger. Uh, yeah. But I, I really would have to try to find a paper that looks at it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Brian, um, you were raising your hand before. Do you have a question? Brian, yes, you. Do we have any evidence that um, the mass of the stars, the original star, has any influence on the incidence of planet formation? Uh, there is there is some evidence uh, on the uh, on the extreme end. Uh, so if you uh, uh, if you take if you make a very massive star, uh, spectral type O and B, things like ten times the mass of the sun and more massive, uh, then uh, there's uh, there, there's quite a, a good chance that these kind of systems will not have any planets. Uh, that are formed in their accretion disks. We know they have these things have accretion disks, uh, but these very massive things. Uh, <clears throat> so the time scales I told you that the accretion takes about half a million years, and then you got a couple of million years for the lifetime of the disk uh, until they disappear and are converted into planets. Uh, the very massive stars uh, they evolve much much quicker. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, an O-type star will go supernova within two to 20 million years, uh, let's say, uh, which basically ends any planet formation uh, straight away. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's also the, the radiation power is much more, they're much more luminous. There's a lot more radiation, not more heating, uh, which basically evaporates all the dust grains. 
in, in a very large area uh, around those stars uh, and even ionizes all the gas. Uh, so there's simply no way of making planets. Uh, a, because the material is just pushed, pushed out, the radiation pressure is pushed away. And that's what limits the final mass of the stars to some extent as well. Uh, and uh, there's not enough time on top of it. Uh, so there's some evidence on that. Uh, there is, uh, so the Kepler Space Telescope, so they have basically now, they've got, gotten really good statistics, how many planets they found about uh, around which type of star uh, in terms of their masses. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, there is some mass dependence on that, uh, but not uh, very, very uh, strong. Uh, when you get to the very low mass stars, uh, again, uh, uh, they don't have simply a lot of material in their disks, right? If you form something that is 10% of the mass of the sun, uh, the accretion disks are going to be much less massive because otherwise they would make more massive stars. Uh, uh, and there, forming things like Jupiter is quite hard because you barely have enough material, uh, uh, right? So the star is 10 times or maybe 20 times uh, or 100 times Jupiter. So the disk probably doesn't have enough material. Uh, uh, to, to make a couple of Jupiters. Uh, so, uh, but they can still form these rocky planets. Uh, so uh, there are probably some mass dependence, uh, but it's observationally very hard uh, to actually establish that. Uh, and you can only establish this around stars which are on the main sequence, which have completely finished, things that are a couple of billion years old. Uh, because finding the young stars around the forming, pla uh, the, the young planets around forming stars is very, very hard, if not impossible. Uh, uh, yes, we have that one circumstantial evidence where there might be a young planet, uh, uh, but uh, doing this properly with statistics will take a long time uh, to do. And uh, these, so there's a lot of evolution between the planets have formed and we look at them uh, a billion years later when they're on the main sequence and happily uh, doing basically nothing. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, we have some ideas, uh, if you look at uh, one billion year old stars, how many planets they have depending on their mass, but how that translates to how they formed, that is a different issue. Uh, one of the things I should say is most stars actually not form the way I explained to you, they form in binary systems right, uh, where you get two stars or three stars or uh, more orbiting each other. Uh, now, depending on how far away the stars are from each other, that has a huge influence on the disks, right? Uh, if you have two stars which have a separation of five astronomical units, uh, it's very hard to imagine some disks which form planets locally. You might form them further out. Uh, uh, if you have a very close binary, so things that almost touch each other, that go around in a couple of hours, yes, then you can make basically a planetary system around that if you wanted to. Uh, so, uh, but these, uh, these multiple systems, they evolve. Uh, so they, the stars interact with each other. Some stars are thrown out. What then happens to the planets is anyone's guess. Uh, so even in a single system like what we are now, we probably haven't formed as a single star. We definitely haven't, we probably, no, we, we more or less for sure have formed in a cluster of stars. So in a cluster of stars, even single stars will encounter other stars that disrupt the disk uh, because they're all tightly packed, a couple of thousand stars uh, in about 10 by 10 light years. Uh, so you will get these interactions. Uh, so planets tend to be disrupted in their orbit. They might fl be flung out or dragged into the star itself. Uh, there's migration of the planets in those disks uh, uh, and all sorts of things going on. Uh, so it's very hard to kind of draw any conclusions backwards to from what you observe for old stars in the field to the planet formation process, because there's so many things that go on. Uh, well, thank you very much, Gert. And I'd like to thank Anthony and Andreas for setting this up tonight. It's been a novel experience. And let's hope the other ones are at least as successful. Thank you all. Thank you. Well, my, my thanks to you, Dirk, um, because uh, um, I think most of us have learned a huge amount this evening. I mean, I had no idea that you could uh, study structures at such a resolution um, in um, distant uh, 
uh, newly formed stars. It's a, it's a bit of a revelation to me. Um, so normally we would um, all applaud at this point, but I'm not quite sure what, whether An Andreas has a suggestion. We <laughs> but I'd like to say thank you very much anyway. Yeah. You can put the things up in your window. <laughs> yes, we can do that. <laughs> <Okay. React. Bye. laughs> Are we ending this session now? Yes, I think this is the end of the session. Right. So there are a couple of questions that people have raised, I noticed. Oh. Um, oh, right. Yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't notice that some more questions had come in the chat channel. The trouble is, I'm, I'm not, this is the first time I've done this. So um, I'm trying to, I was trying to watch all the, uh, video windows and the uh, uh, I, I rather miss the chat channel so we have a question uh, Sadaharu uh, Uhara to, um, about the observed periodicities uh, can I ask you to I'll un, ask you to unmute uh, 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 I'm sorry for my, my late, uh, late late notification the uh, the, my question is about the uh, observation of the different periodicities. Uh, you uh, showed uh, a few examples of the only one uh, distinct periodicity is uh, observed for one star. But I think the uh, periodicity is in principle superposition of many components. So uh, uh, I uh, suppose that there are some examples of the two or three, uh, some distinct number of the periodicities are uh, observed. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, know about the, such examples. Thank you. Uh, so, so if I if I get the uh, question right, so it's about the uh, the periodicity uh, and if it is the only one mm. uh, for that star. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, and how we actually find it. Uh, so, uh, these uh, periodograms that you can uh, calculate. Uh, basically, what they, they they try to do is see for every period that you can make. Uh, <clears throat> how significant uh, is it? Uh, and uh, we, we tested a number of methods uh, to do this. Uh, <clears throat> so technically, uh, if you look at uh, the data we have, uh, one picture roughly every day, uh, and you have a period of 20 hours, uh, anyone who understands period searches says you can't find that. Uh, and this is true. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so we have uh, for, uh, we have the data set where we have uh, for, uh, the six weeks, uh, a huge amount of data. Uh, so basically 10 images uh, each night, uh, which uh, allows you to also find these very short periods. Now, uh, the problem with this is uh, when you do this analysis for every star, uh, then you might find uh, a lot of periods which look significant uh, and you have to actually make a decision uh, to, uh, if that, uh, period is correct uh, and even uh, even real. Uh, and uh, this, this is actually a non-trivial task. Uh, so, uh, but uh, for longer periods, uh, it's, it's very easy. So if you actually uh, observe in a whole night and you can see the star going up and down, uh, then you can, uh, uh, can see that the period is correct. Uh, we always uh, have problems with um, what's called aliasing. Uh, which basically means uh, if you observe a star once a day uh, and you look for periodic signals, one of the things you always find is a period of one day. Uh, uh, so, uh, which is of course not real, it's your observing frequency, but you're always gonna find it. Uh, uh, but uh, we have, uh, since two and a half years now, I have a maths PhD student uh, and her sole PhD thesis uh, is about how in a data set like we have uh, that is uh, randomly sampled uh, where each data point has a different uncertainty. Uh, <clears throat> how do you uh, best find period, periodic signals? Uh, and one of the advantages we have, have is we have different filters. So the observations in the green uh, are completely independent to the observations in the red because they're taken at different times by different people. 
Uh, and uh, so one of the things we do is we, we measure these, we try to find these periods in the different filters. Uh, and if they actually agree with each other, it's pretty much certain that they're correct. Uh, so I'm not sure if that answers your, your actual question. Um, there are objects sometimes who might have more than one period. Uh, uh, but again, uh, the objects we so far picked, uh, they don't have that. So you can basically imagine a combination of, of, of object one and two that I showed you, where you have a star with spots and at the same time a disk warp. Uh, and what you will find there is you find the rotation period uh, and you find uh, the, the period of the warp. And then you get uh, two components uh, and then you simply have to disentangle those. Uh, so for the examples that I showed, we picked them because they have one single easy to analyze thing. So as I said before, there will be uh, a lot of uh, objects where this is not as easily possible. So you could, for example, say that there's two structures in a disk. One is closer in and one is further out. Uh, and they both do occultations. Uh, and because they are different distances, they will have different periods. Uh, and again, then you get dips uh, with one period, one with another. It's the same as looking at Kepler data where you have exoplanets uh, and you have a system of exoplanets, right? You see these dimming events from the planets, uh, but uh, they, they seem to be uh, completely irregular because you have seven planets orbiting the same star, each with a different period. Uh, and uh, then your actual kind of forest of, uh, of eclipses looks uh, at first look very random. Uh, TRAPPIST-1 is a good example of that. Uh, and then, uh, but once you find one, one period, you remove that signal uh, and then you look for another period in the rest of the signal and so forth until there's nothing left. And the, usually the first thing you find is the strongest one, the one with the highest amplitude that's easiest to find. Uh, so <clears throat> that, that's basically uh, the, the way you would go about looking for things that are like a star with spots and a structure in the disk uh, that is happening at both times. So if the disk structure makes a huge amplitude variation, you're gonna find this signal first, which looks very noisy. So you move the, the disk one uh, and then you try to find, uh, is there a period in the other signal? And that could be the underlying rotation. Right. We. Um... It is nearly 10 past nine now, so we've gone on longer than we uh, normally do. So I'm going to call an end to it here. I'm, um, but it's probably best to stop while we're still eager to know more than the other way around. And so once again, let's um, thank Dirk Frobrick and uh, uh, let's uh, hope that we'll have many, many more lectures and I, let's hope that they will be real physical lectures as soon as possible because I think I think we prefer that or perhaps both at the same time. Well thank you for having me. Thank you very much.